Hello and welcome to Covenant Calendar Club. We're glad you're here and we hope that you're blessed by this video. Let's everybody give a warm welcome to those watching the video. Just shout out, hello. Hello. Hi. Shabbat shalom. Hi. Shalom. 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 We, we hope you are blessed and we welcome. want to thank our instructors who will be hearing the Joshua study presentation. This is the presentation that you've all been waiting for. Um, there's a lot to cover, and so we're excited to go ahead and get into it right away. And here we go. Take it away, Tim or Charlene, whoever is heading up the presentation. And for those of us that aren't on, if we can mute our mic so we'll get a nice quality recording the best that we can. Okay, so uh, first of all, before I bring up my PowerPoint, um, I'll, I'll be uh, doing the screen share tonight, and I have selected um, quite a few slides for readers, so I'm just going to ask for readers. It doesn't matter who it is, if you're welcome uh, to come in when I say I need a reader for slides 10 and 11. <laughs> um, I have uh, uh, selected slides for Tim as well, because he's definitely team teaching here, and we do this together. So other than that, I didn't choose anybody in particular. And I just want to make mention that we're not doing any review this week from last week. I think we did a really good review last week, so we don't need to start that again. And, and this is the study that you've been waiting for. I think that everybody's ready for it. We've done a lot in Genesis 1 for foundation, and Tim and I talked about it, and we really feel you're ready for this study tonight. So I will, I will do the uh, screen share here. Um, if I can figure it out. We got everybody? Looks good so far. Can you hear me? Can everybody there hear me? Go. Now you got it. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, we can hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. I I guess we're ready to get started then. So um, this is Joshua's first observance uh, when they went into the land for uh, the full Passover festival into the land of Canaan. <clears throat> And did we start with prayer already? No, oh, we need to pray. Okay, Tim, would you go ahead and do that for us? Abba Yahuwah, thank you for this opportunity to, to share your word, to look into it and to examine what, what your word actually says from the Hebrew letters that have been inspired Thank you that we have all these people on, on here that are willing to, to dig in and take to heart what, what, what can be shown, what can be seen. Father, we ask that your word is heard. We ask that the Ruach comes and speaks to us each one tonight and convicts us of your will, whatever it is that you have for us to, be, uh, to know and understand. And we ask that each one of us will shema to your word, that is to listen and to act accordingly. And I ask for a special blessing on Charlene, help her to be able to speak, and offer you Amen. 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 Okay. Uh, we've um, been restoring Yahuwah's calendar. And I know there's many that want to follow in his footsteps and respond to worship and adoration, especially honoring the sabbatical worship statutes and the festivals. Oh my, they're of utmost importance. Oh. However, the enemy has been very clever. <laughs> He's been working tonight. He has managed to get many of Yah's sincere followers sidetracked when it comes to honoring Yahuwah's appointed times. No, he didn't drink it. Uh, <laughs> like he just uh, one second, Charlene. Um, if you're not uh, using your mic, uh, could you please mute mic while Charlene does the presentation? Okay. Thank you. We I appreciate that. 
And uh, just you'll hear some background noise in there. So. I'll be using a reader for slides 10 and 11 so they can get ready. And Tim, you'll be on slide 13. I hope you can see the slide numbers. And we do have about 100 slides, so we want to get going. Anyway, um, restoration of Yah's divine calendar has been a huge task. And I know that many have had it in their search engines for a long time. But I think there's really good news that the Lewis perfect divine calendar is being restored right now. And uh, we've just felt really, really privileged to be able to share what we have found over the years. And there's even better news than that. This calendar is simple, easy, logical, and elegant. It's elegant and pleasing. So uh, here we go tonight. Restoration of Yah's first fruits. Even though the weekly Sabbath has been restored to commence at dawn rather than sunset, midnight, or sunrise, and we're in the process of uh, commencing the new months by just counting 1 to 30 instead of looking for the lunar crescent or the conjunction, there are some out there now that are, are searching for the full moon to begin their month. Well, we don't have to do that anymore. And we know that the commencement of the new year has been restored by waiting for the spring equinox. And we know how we're, we're going to teach this someday on how to end the old year and how the new year begins instead of uh, waiting for the barley or for the new moon to come along. So all those things are being restored. But there still seems to be quite a bit of confusion over the placement of first fruits or the wave sheet which ultimately affects the placement of Pentecost 50 days later. And some might just say, first fruits needs to have restoration, like, are you sure? And what I want to make sure that everybody understands tonight is that this study is addressing the wave sheep first fruits during the Passover festival. Um, it's just come to my attention here recently that wave sheaf can also apply, have a meaning or an application to the, pes, uh, the, the um, Pentecost festival. But this one tonight we're doing is related to the Passover festival. So some might say, well, it doesn't really matter because first fruits isn't that important anyway. My feast friends and my feast camp never pay too much attention to the first fruits festival. So I don't think it's that crucial. We really don't need to know about it. Well, this is what we say. If there's any question about the placement of first fruits and Pentecost, probably the best thing to do is to check it out with the scriptures and just see. So Joshua just shines. He's going to walk us through the proper placement of first fruits through this wonderful encounter that Israel experienced when they finally got ready to cross the Jordan and go across into the heavenly Canaan. Now, there are going to be two options here. We're going to examine two ways of celebrating first fruits. And no matter what day first fruits is celebrated on, <clears throat> we know that the 50 day Omer count is going to establish when Pentecost is, and it would always be on the same day as first fruits. And both of these ways are affected equally. Uh, so the first way is, does first fruits follow unleavened bread, Sabbath, which would be Aviv 16? Or is first fruits going to follow the H7676 weekly Sabbath? Those are the two options we're going to look at tonight. And there's a few other things that we'll enter in as well. There are five testimonies for the proper placement of first fruits in the scriptures that we have found. Uh, for a long time, it seemed that Leviticus 23 was sort of the only witness, and of course, Numbers 15 goes along with that. But there are now three very strong additional witnesses from scripture, plus we have a secular historical account. So uh, witness number two is the Exodus 12, 16 to 19 study. We did that in November, which uh, gives a witness to First Fruits and Pentecost, the Omer Count Tani. Uh, Joshua chapters 
three to five is the one we're doing tonight. The gospel account, including the Wednesday crucifixion, the Sabbath resurrection, and the first day ascension. That is another witness. Uh, we're just really hoping to do that study one day. Another witness is secular history around Rashbi. And then there's a quote from Julian Morgenstern. All interesting things. But we're not going over all of those things today. We're going to uh, study only three areas in this particular study. It will be Leviticus and Numbers. And the number two one is Joshua. And we will be looking at some of the history so you can see what has actually happened. Uh, Joshua also includes three sets of counting patterns and it's one, two, three. And I know that you've uh, heard us say before that when you're working with calendar, you have to know how to count. And um, it, it seems really um, uh, kindergarten-like to say that we need to learn how to count to three. There are three sets of counting to three in this Joshua study, and we need to know how to do this counting because it will help us when we actually look at the passion account and uh, the three days and three nights. Plus, as I said, they, there will be a statement from the Hebrew Union College uh, in the United States. I'm not sure if it's Ohio or Illinois or Iowa. Um, but anyway, we'll have a witness from Morgan Stern about that. I'm going to tell you right up front, not going to hold you in suspense, and you might want to write this down if you have a pencil. The Joshua study is going to prove that the Passover in this event happened on the weekly Sabbath, of course, at Bib 14. It's going to prove that without any problem whatsoever. He is also going to show that the unleavened bread Sabbath was indeed on a Bib 15, like we know um, from the scripture uh, studies in the Torah. And he is also going to show us that first fruits wave sheaf was placed on a Bib 15 not a Bib 16 and not a Bib 26 or 27. It was on a Bib 15 in this. This is where he absolutely shines. So we would like you to uh, keep these things in mind. There's going to be a lot of review. Um, I had a lady, uh, one of the calendar friends, and maybe she's on tonight, I'm not sure, but she asked us to make sure that we do a lot of review, and there will be. So is everybody ready? <laughs> Nod your heads. <laughs> because here we go. And I was going to have a reader help me with slides 10 and 11. So if there is maybe one of the ladies that could help us with slides 10 and 11 this time. I'll read for no observance of first group in the wave sheet. Okay, we have a, we have a volunteer, go ahead. Um, because of, uh, okay, so no observance of first fruits in the wilderness. Because Israel's sin with the golden calf, a whole new set of laws for the Aaronic priesthood, sacrificial laws, and the sanctuary services were commanded upon the people. Israel is exempted from entering Canaan for 40 plus years because of the golden calf violation. Shortly after the sanctuary was raised up, Israel sinned again by refusing to enter Canaan based upon an evil report of the ten spies. Since Moses would not be leading the children into the land of Canaan, Yahuwah did give explicit instructions on how to observe, observe the first, first fruits upon their entrance. Obviously, obviously, there would not have been 40 years of rehearsals for the people to, and then my screen cuts off that bottom line there. Oh, okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, well, it says that there was no way for, the, the people were not rehearsing all of the festivals in the wilderness. Of course, we know for, for sure First Fruits wasn't rehearsed. Um, but from now on, all of the festivals will be rehearsed. Sylvia, can you keep going with slide number 11? We have a little bit of review here right away. Mm -hmm. um, the first observance of Spring Feast in Canaan, uh, Joshua preparing to take the lead in Joshua 24, 15. Joshua will show the exact day of the week for the observance of Passover on Abib 14th, the seventh day Sabbath, first fruits on Abib 15th, 
the first day of unleavened bread on Abib 15th, this information is necessary to understand the following charts. Note, this study is based on the day beginning with dawn, not sunset. Yes, thank you very much. And Tim, um, I'm going to have you on slide 13. I'll just do the in-between part right here. So in, in Chapter 1 of Joshua, he's preparing the people uh, to go into the land. And in the first nine verses, he basically begins with this divine commission to go in and take the land. The promise was given in verse 3 that wherever the soles of their sandals would tread, the land was reserved for Israel. And then if we go ahead and read verses 10 to 22 in chapter 1, this is where you'll find Joshua gives commands to the officers for taking the land. But I would like to read verse 11. This is what he says. Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you to possess. We have quite a few charts in this study, and they're not animated, so um, we'll just look at them briefly. But this is the first place where we have a timeline of three days. I'll just use my mouse here. I've already set up the charts to tell you what day it is, because we are assuming that Passover is going to be the 14th of Abib. So we've worked this backwards so it doesn't have to be a puzzle for you to fight through until the very end. But anyway, it is Friday or the sixth cycle. It is Abib 6 as well. And this is where they're preparing to cross over the Jordan. Now, um, Joshua said, within three days you will cross over. So this is our first set of counting. This here starts to count at the morning of Abib 7. The counting does not start back here at the morning of Abib 6. I don't know when he gave them the command, but the command begins the next day. Then you have three days. I don't, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse or not. I'll go up here. Here's your first day from dawn to dawn. Your second day would be on Sunday or the first cycle of the week would be your second day. And your third day is Monday, uh, Abib 9. So they have three days to wait before they're going to cross. And this little squiggly line here is the Jordan River, three days before they cross. And if you don't mind, um, please allow me to use the pagan names of the weekdays. It'll make the presentation flow a little bit quicker. So Tim, I would like you to read the first review slide. Um, there's about 12 of these slides. They all look like this. And we'll be uh, doing a review as we go through. So, Tim, I'll just hand that over to you. Joshua is going to confirm for us that Abib 14 is the weekly Sabbath, or the seventh day Sabbath as we know it. Therefore, Abib 1 is a first cycle, or in pagan terms, a Sunday in this year of entering the land. And I'm going to tell you in a minute why, it, why we note this, where Abib 1 is the first cycle. 1A, Enoch calendar claims Abib 1 is always on the fourth cycle or Wednesday. They're very adamant about, their, about that. Their whole calendar is adjusted accordingly so that they can always have the first day of the year on a fourth cycle or a Wednesday. That is one of their foundational claims of their calendar. And you're going to see in this Joshua study that it is absolutely impossible for the first day of the month, the first day of the year, to be on a fourth cycle. Aligning Enoch with Joshua would place Abib 14 on the third cycle, not a Sabbath. Only in Enoch months 3, 6, 9, and 12 will the 14th day of the month align with the seventh day Sabbath of the week. So this is, this is in, or Enoch's calendar is in total opposition to what we're going to see in this story of Joshua. And it's going to require you to pay attention and think very, very carefully if Joshua 
if he observed the statutes of Yahuwah or not. And uh, I will, my, my conclusion from my, from my study is Joshua is not following an Enoch calendar. And uh, we'll see what you say at the end of this study. Thank you very much, Tim. And uh, I would like a reader for slides 17 and 18, maybe a gentleman the next time, 17 and 18. And I'll do the ones in between. Joshua chapter 2 is about Rahab and the spies. And um, right here on Abib 6, this was the day that he announced they had to wait three days before they crossed the Jordan. This is where Joshua sent out his spies. They went into Jericho and they snooped around a little bit and they got caught. Somebody said, wait a second, these guys don't look like they belong here. And I'm quite sure that Joshua expected the spies to go into Jericho, do whatever they had to do, and get back to camp that night before it got dark. But it didn't work out that way. And uh, Rahab comes along, and she hides the spies. She figured out that there was something going on. Jerrica closes the gates at dark, and uh, someone knocks on her door and says, Rahab, did you see those spies? Remember, her house was on the wall, and um, she says, oh, I think they got out before the gates got shut. Well, they closed the gates at dark, so she said, yeah, I think they got away before the gates were dark, got shut, closed, and it was dark. So she had them, and she let them go. So it was already after the gates were closed probably about the time it was getting dark. So the spies had a message from Rahab. She said, you are to hide for three days in the mountains. So we have our second um, set of counting here now. Remember our first set? Joshua said, in three days, we're going to cross the Jordan. So that's up here, starting with Sabbath, Sunday, Monday. That was the three days to count. But here, the spies are hiding. I'm pretty sure they were hoping to get back to camp that night. But she said, no, you go hide three days, three days in the mountains. So because they left here, this is where they went to start hiding. This is where the count now begins for the three days. It starts at night here. Three days, and it goes to night. That's your 24-hour cycle. So they're going to hide the night of Friday, all day Sabbath, Sabbath night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, and then they are going to come back into camp when their three days are up. We will do another set of counting besides this. So you'll see these arrows, they're a little bit different colors. And i just like you to um, kind of um, keep that in mind as we go along. In Chapter 3, Joshua is preparing to cross the Jordan. And the spies return the night of Abib 9. It is a Monday evening. And he says in verse 2, and it, it says, It came to be after three days that the officers went into the midst of the camp. And then we'll look at verse 3. It was a really busy night, that Abib Monday night. It says, And they commanded the people, saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of Yahuwah your Elohim and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. So they're, I'm just sure they're all excited and all geared up. They're probably not sleepy one little bit. And then early on a beat 10, this would be Tuesday morning, and I need to go back to verse 1 for this information. Now, normally, we do not have these verses out of order. But in this case, we go back to verse 1 uh, to see what Joshua is doing. It says, Joshua rose early in the morning. This is a phrase that you hear all over the place, in, um, especially with Moses and the plagues, early in the morning or very early in the morning. So here he is. He's up and going. And they set out from Shittim, and they came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and they stayed there before they passed over. Now, the next chart is going to pick up from a B9. So I've got these arrows in here so that you can follow as you know closely as possible. 
The command was three days we're going to cross the Jordan. So this is the last day before they cross, okay? The spies came back right here. They got back right here at dusk after they finished their three 24-hour cycles. They returned. We'll just follow these box numbers. Then the officers gave commands for the Ark of the Covenant. We read those verses already. And the officers also told the people they are to sanctify themselves for tomorrow. And that would be the 10th of Abib. Tomorrow is where there's going to be lots of wonders. And then we just read right here that Joshua rose early in the morning. This would have been of the 10th day. And they started to set out for the Jordan with, um, with all of Israel. Now, I don't know how far they had to go, but they set out early, probably as soon as it started to get light. The priests take up the Ark of the Covenant, and they cross over before the people. And then we have another command here. Yahuwah said to Joshua, this day, that's going to be a B10, okay? This day, I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel. And we have an account that about 40,000 crossed over the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month. It was a really exciting time. So I'm just asking for a gentleman to read Joshua 4, chapter 4, and give us a summary of what happened in that chapter. For uh, slides 17 and 18. I have a volunteer. Charlene. Joshua. Okay, Dana. Jordan Memorial. Okay. I got a two second delay here. When all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, the next divine command to Joshua was to select 12 men to represent every tribe. They were to bring Memorial from the riverbed. And chapter 5. At that time, oh, Yahweh said unto Joshua, Make the sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And it came to pass, when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp, till they were whole. And Yahuwah said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you, wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. King James Version. At this point, the scriptures bring the events to Abib 13. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know who's uh, speaking. I don't recognize all of your voices. But anyway, let's look at chart number four, uh, Joshua chapter five. This is where we're talking about the men being circumcised. And I'll just give you a little bit of review here. Here's the crossing of the Jordan here with this blue line on uh, Tuesday of the 10. And then the report was that all the men had to be circumcised before uh, going into the land. Now the ones that were circumcised in Egypt, probably most of them had passed away by this time. So the ones that were left had to go through this little ceremony. We'll look here at box 13. The flint knives were made to circumcise the sons of Israel. And after the circumcising here in box 14, the men stayed in their camp places till they were healed. Now the question is, how long would it be till they were healed? It doesn't give us any information about this, but I just went looking um, here in box 15. I just have a little bit from Genesis 34. It has some clues for the healing process where... Um, I believe this was the story of uh, Dinah, um, where, <laughs> I'm sure you remember it, where they circumcised all the males um, and went out of the gate. And it does say there, on the third day when they were in pain, and remember they went in and killed all the males at that time. So 
I'm, I'm saying from that there has to be at least three days of healing. So if we look here at box number 16, we're saying they started the circumcising probably early in the morning, um, just like they had a, a habit of doing as getting up early or very early in the morning, and it probably was quite a task. So we have now here three days that they probably needed to have for healing. So this is your third count, okay, the third set of counting. I did not know exactly where to start this, but I started it here in the morning, a set of three, um, assuming that they would need at least three days. And we're coming up now, the end of this third day would bring you up to the evening before Passover. I'll be waiting for a reader to read slide 21 when I'm done with this one. So this is our second review sheet, and Joshua is going to confirm that a B11 was actually on the midst of the week, or a Wednesday, the fourth cycle, when the circumcising began, would have been on this day right here. We have our Passover festival over here on the seventh day Sabbath, but we have found in our studies with the book of Enoch, and I know that there's many different books of Enoch, and I'm not sure they all say the same thing, but I've uh, looked at about three of them, and this is what they're saying, that a big one is always placed on the fourth cycle. So I just put a little calendar here, that a big one always has to be on the fourth cycle for the first day of the year. That means on Enoch's calendar, the 11th would be on a weekly Sabbath. And I'm here to say, along with Tim, that Joshua will not agree with Enoch's reckoning at all. Is there any questions about this slide before I move it to the next slide? No? Okay, so do I have a reader for slide 21? Now I'll go ahead and read. Uh, first Passover celebration in Canaan, Joshua 5.10. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal, and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plain of Jericho, in James Version. We are still assuming Passover will be on the Sabbath 14th, and it will be exposed solidly later in this study. Can the Passover and the weekly Sabbath share the same day without scripture, scriptural reference? Remember, no manna is sent on the Sabbath. Okay, so this is a really important question. Can the Passover share the weekly Sabbath? Can they both be on the same date? Because there is some contention over this issue, and we'll be uh, addressing that here in a little bit. Okay, Tim, I will have you do slides 24 and 25. I'm going to do the next two. Passover on a seventh day, weekly Sabbath? Can that really happen? Like, should Passover ever, ever be celebrated on a weekly Sabbath? Or should we just adjust the feast calendar so Passover never, ever lands on the weekly Sabbath? These are important questions. I just want to show to you, uh, there's two calendars below. There's uh, 2015 Looney Solar Feast Calendar is the first one, and then the 2016 Covenant Feast Calendar that we were following in 2016. And I just want to show you that even um, this first uh, Looney Solar Feast Calendar, can you see they've got Passover in red? They have Passover on a weekly Sabbath. They have their unleavened bread and their first fruits. First fruits is purple. They've got their first fruits following the weekly Sabbath. And on the calendar that we were following in 2016, um, we had Passover was actually April 2. You can see the purple there. And the Unleavened Bread Sabbath and the Wave Sheaf both were on the next day of B15. And that's exactly the same pattern that we have in this particular study. But what about the Jewish calendar? What about that? 
And Tim's going to read the next two slides for me. I can't hear you, Tim, because you have your mic shut off. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Joshua will be celebrating a Bib 14 Passover on the weekly Sabbath. There is no need to adjust the date. Jewish calendars are adjusted, manipulated, I can add, to avoid the celebration of certain feasts on the weekly Sabbath. Jewish calendars are very, very well known and self-admitted that they are a fully calculated calendar. And that's a very, very important point for us to, re to remember. Uh, they, they want to avoid having these feast days of Passover and a Day of Atonement on a Seventh-day Sabbath, and they will do whatever it takes to avoid that, including changing their calendar to suit their faith. Does a Sabbath Passover demand servile work? Some feel if Passover lands on the Sabbath, it should be moved to Abib 15, so the commands of both the Seventh-day Sabbath and Passover can be honored without conflict. Even today, some of the Jews' calculations for Jewish festivals are arbitrary and set by men, not Scripture. Their annual festivals can be off as much as two days from the original day ordained by the Jewish calendar commands, especially if the annual feasts occur on or close to the weekly Sabbath. There is no scriptural command to exempt Passover from falling on the weekly Sabbath. As has been noted, the preparations for Passover can be done on the preparation day. The extra Passover sacrifice was not a Sabbath violation according to scripture, and I would like to cite do you remember on the Seventh-day Sabbath, they do double the sacrifices? Uh, so we're, we're saying by scriptural example that no, Passover does not need to be moved so that it doesn't land on the Seventh-day Sabbath. And Joshua is going to confirm this very, very clearly in this study. Go ahead, Tim. The unleavened bread for the first Passover in Canaan. Even though Israel was in the land of Canaan with grain all around them, the scripture command was firm. Israel was not allowed to touch the old or new grain for their unleavened bread at the Passover meal on Abib 14. Partaking of unleavened bread from grain became part of the festival on Abib 15 after the wave sheaf ceremony was completed, Leviticus 23.6. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto Yahuwah. Let's place the first Sabbath of Unleavened Bread, Abib 15, on the chart. And we are still assuming, for this study's purposes at this point, that Passover is on the seventh day Sabbath. Thank you, Tim. And I'll have a reader be ready for slide number 30. On this chart, we're going to be looking at Passover on the 14th, and we know that unleavened bread follows on the very next day, which is the 15th. <clears throat> so this should be pretty easy. Passover is on. We're still assuming Sabbath, Abib 14. This is where they celebrated their sacrifice at the night hour, likely. And um, they go through the Passover night. Remember from the Exodus 12 account, this was the night that they could handle the lamb and eat the lamb, be with the lamb all night long. But the command was that once morning came, the lamb had to be out of sight. It had to be burnt and out of sight. So this was the Passover night where they could um, enjoy their Passover meal with the lamb. Of course, the exchange of the new day comes right here at the dawn. And then we know from the verse that we just read that unleavened bread is a babe 
the 15th, and this would have been Sunday or the first cycle of the week. It says right there in Leviticus 23.6, we'll just review it. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto Yahuwah. And don't forget, we are still assuming that Passover was on this Sabbath right here. We have not proved this yet. Now we will compare <clears throat> Passover the 14th <clears throat> with First Fruits the 15th. Joshua 5.11, it says, And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, on leaven cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. So we should look at this Hebrew definition for morrow, and it's 4283. I don't know how to say that in Hebrew. I'll just let you look at it. Anyway, the definitions are the morrow, tomorrow, or the day after. Definitely not the same day, and none of the definitions are timed anywhere near sunset. Still comparing Passover the 14th with first fruits on the 15th, we're noting that Morrow begins in the morning, and that's with the arrival of daylight. Therefore, first fruits is going to begin at that point. And Joshua 5.11 was very specific. He said, Israel ate the grain on the morrow after the Passover. Remember, they were not allowed to take any of the grain for their own use until the wave sheep ceremony was completed. This is the very most important part of the whole study. So first fruits is being established on Abib 15, but we are still assuming that Passover is on the seventh day Sabbath. It has not been proved yet. Here's a review slide for any of those that need it. Joshua confirms that first fruits is going to be right here on a B15, the morrow after the Passover, which was on Sabbath the 14th. And I need a volunteer for reading slide 30. Anybody? I can read it. I'll read it. Um, okay. okay. Moses' instructions for first fruits. Uh, numbers 15, 18 to 19. When you come into the land, whither I bring you, then it shall be that when you eat of the bread of the land, you shall offer up a heave offering, the wave sheath, unto Yahuwah. Leviticus 23.10, speak to the children of Israel, and you shall say to them, when you come into the land, through the leadership of Joshua, which I give you, and shall reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheath of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. These two verses, along with Joshua 5.11, are very specific. First fruits will be celebrated in Canaan, not in the wilderness. This next verse in Leviticus 23.11 is a prophecy of what will happen. This is a really important point. This prophecy of first fruits, this is something that we learned with this study that was exciting. This is another major portion of the study. And Tim, if you want to get ready for slides 33 to 35 while I'm doing these ones. So the prophecy of Leviticus 23.11, what is it? This is what the verse says. And he shall wave the sheaf before Yahuwah for your acceptance. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest waves it. Here's a question. Morrow after the Sabbath? Which Sabbath is this verse referring to? Is it talking about the weekly Sabbath? Or is it talking about the first Sabbath of unleavened bread? This is the question that we are wanting to answer. Which morrow is it? In other words, is first fruits established on the morrow after the Passover Sabbath? Or is first fruits on the morrow after the unleavened bread Sabbath? That is the big question of this study. 
And Tim, I'll let you go ahead with the next three slides. Moral, according to Moses, Leviticus 23.11. <clears throat> and he shall wave the sheaf before Yahuwah for your acceptance. On the morrow, after the Sabbath, the priest waves it. I want you to take note of that word acceptance. You're going to see more of that word uh, emphasized very, very strongly later on in this, in this study. So please recognize that word. Sabbath, which is Strong's H7676. It's uh, intensive from H7673, intermission, specifically the Sabbath. H7676 is specific, noting the Leviticus 23.11 Sabbath is the weekly Sabbath, or the seventh-day Sabbath as we understand it, as designated by the Hebrew word number H7676. However, that raises a question, as most believe that the first day of unleavened bread is also a Sabbath. Are the feast Sabbaths connected to the Hebrew number H7676? No and yes. Absolutely, because that 7676 is an important number. Thank you, Tim. Just continue. Comparison of H7677 to H7676. And H7677, Shabbaton, from H7676, a Sabbatism or special holiday. KGV says rest or Sabbath. Some H7677 feast Sabbaths are first day of Feast of Trumpets, and you'll see that in Leviticus 23.24, and the first and eighth days of Feast of Tabernacles, Leviticus 23.39. There is one H7676 feast Sabbath, and that is the Day of Atonement. That is the most Kodesh Shabbat of the whole year. So yes, the only feast Sabbath connected to H7676 is the Day of Atonement. And I should say the only feast Sabbath other than the Seventh-day Sabbath, which is the premier flagship feast of Yahuwah. Question, are the unleavened bread Sabbaths connected to H7676 or H7677? Note the scriptural account. Leviticus 23.5, in the 14th day of the first month at even is Yahuwah's Passover. Verse 6, and on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto Yahuwah. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have a Kodesh convocation. And it says holy there. I like the word Kodesh quite a bit better because it's Hebrew. And ye shall do no servile work therein. The festival Sabbaths of the first and seventh days of unleavened bread and Pentecost, are not numbered with either H7676 or H7677. If you go back up to Leviticus 23, verse 6, on this slide, you will see on the right-hand side where it says feast, and that is H2282. Note that number. We'll be seeing more of that. The unleavened, the unleavened bread Sabbaths, are listed as Kodesh Convocations. Thank you, Tim. What I want everybody to recognize is that these numbers in blue, 7676 here, and 7677, the one in red, these are very important numbers. This is going to be the distinction that's going to draw the line in the sand for this study tonight. This was a surprise to us when we did this. 
Okay, uh, Tim, I'd just like you to be ready for slides 39 to 42. I'll do the ones in between. There are some important Hebrew definitions that we want to look at that we just read of. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, actually, Feast is the definition number that, um, pardon me, 2282 goes along with Feast, not Unleavened Bread. But anyway, it says at Chai from 2287. It's a festival, or a victim, therefore, a solemn feast day, sacrifice or solemnity. So this Feast of Unleavened Bread is definitely a solemn feast day. Holy uh, comes up with the word 6944. That is Kodesh. It is a sacred place, a consecrated thing, hallowed. Holiness, Kodesh, we're a little bit more familiar with Kodesh in Hebrew. But anyway, definitely has special recognition. Convocation is word number 4744. It's Makra, something to be called out, like a public meeting, a rehearsal, or an assembly. This is a calling out, a convocation, all linked together with the, um, pardon me, we didn't need to go there quite yet, all linked together with Feast of Unleavened Bread, and with Holy Convocation, this is definitely a very special day. <clears throat> so these Hebrew numbers that we have at the top, 7676 and 7677, these are referring to uh, festival Sabbath. This, the first one is your weekly Sabbath. And 7677 is referring to Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Tabernacles, Okay, your David Atonement is your 76 number. These are your fall feast days. These numbers of 2282, 6944, and 4744 are also important numbers that are linked to um, Festival Sabbaths. But I'd like you to note that the phrases of Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Holy Convocation are never, ever listed as a weekly Sabbath with the Hebrew number 7676. And these, this Feast of Unleavened Bread is not listed as an annual feast with the number 7677. And there is a very, very good reason for this. I did not realize this when we were starting out with the study, but um, I was always taught that Feast of Unleavened Bread and Pentecost, the two Sabbaths of Unleavened Bread and Pentecost, were number 7676. I just believed everybody and um, thought that was so. When I went and looked it up, I couldn't find it. The Hebrew definitions confirm the first fruits placement. First fruits does not follow the holy convocation of the first unleavened bread Sabbath period. In Joshua 5.11, first fruits follows only the weekly Sabbath of 7676, and this study happens to be um, a B15 for first fruits. So first fruit is not following a Sabbath that has any of the numbers 2282, 6944, or 4744 connected to it. Okay, Tim, I'd like you to do uh, slides 39 to 42. Joshua confirms we must pay attention to which Sabbath days are understood as H7676 Shabbats and 7677 Shabbaton. First fruits follows only the 76, 76 Shabbat. First fruits never follows days linked to 2282 Sheg or 6944 Kodesh or 4744 Convocation. It's coming. I'm waiting. There we are. <laughs> Finally, Passover is the Sabbath. On the left, you'll see Sabbath, Abib 14, Passover day. Then on the next to the right, you'll see Abib 14, 
Passover night in the black. And then comes dawn, and we see first fruits is the morrow after the weekly Sabbath. Sunday, Abib 15, is the first fruits and unleavened bread Sabbath. Uh, it is uh, not the morrow after the first unleavened bread Sabbath. The wave sheaf of first fruits can only be waved the day after the weekly Sabbath. Joshua confirms first fruits follows Passover on Abib 15. First fruits follows the H7676 weekly Sabbath. Therefore, Passover was celebrated on the weekly Sabbath. Now, one, one thing I want to point out is when, when Joshua was going into the land of Canaan, I, he was reading the instructions that Moshe had given him. It was all written, all written down, recorded. That's what he followed. And if these instructions did not tell, tell Joshua to observe first fruits after, a, after an unleavened bread Sabbath, then he had to observe it after the weekly Sabbath. Because the unleavened bread, uh, unleavened bread convocation was not listed as a Sabbath. Therefore, Joshua could not possibly have observed it after an unleavened bread Sabbath because it simply was not listed as a Sabbath at that point. Moshe had written uh, H7676, the seventh day Sabbath. Therefore, Joshua could only have a could only have, have observed first fruits after a seventh day Sabbath. There's just no other possibility. And I believe Yahuwah did this very specifically so that there would be absolutely no confusion whatsoever for Joshua. Now, Enoch in their calendar has every Passover celebration on the third cycle of the week each year. This is very consistent. This is through the design of their calendar. Can that line up with Joshua's example? And we're going, I'm just asking you to pay attention to this because uh, we're going to continue on and you'll see it a little bit clearer later on. Yes, and thank you very much, Tim. So um, what we're, before you go on to the next slide, because it's talking about Lunar Sabbath, um, <clears throat> we're just feeling that uh, the people that are studying the Enoch calendar haven't had a chance to study the Joshua uh, witness that is here that is so very, very strong and, and actually very, very clear. So this particular slide that Tim is going to do is going to talk about another different calendar. It's the lunar calendar that follows the moon cycles. Okay, Tim? Joshua confirms the weekly Sabbath was on Abib 14. On the lunar Sabbaths, this is the, the fluid Sabbaths, as some of them are called, the, their Sabbaths are claimed to only be on the 8th, the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th. The problem is, Joshua is confirming to us solidly by statute of Yahuwah that the weekly Seventh-day Sabbath was in fact on Abib 14. And that causes a severe, severe problem with the lunar fluid Sabbath. Joshua does not allow weekly lunar Sabbaths to have recognition on your calendar. Thank you, Tim. I would like uh, a reader to get ready for slides 46 and 47 while I do the next three. So finally, first fruits is going to be understood. And this discovery will eliminate two other false teachings. And here they are. Number one. The false teaching that first fruits must always be celebrated on Abib 16, that's the day after unleavened bread. And the other false teaching is that it always follows the first Sabbath of unleavened bread. So these two false teachings are straightened out with Joshua's account. He makes sure that the record is set straight. And there is absolutely no misunderstanding, no twisting, nothing of the sort. 
So in our review slide number 8 of 12, Joshua is confirming that first fruits will never ever follow the first Sabbath of unleavened bread on Abib 16. And he is also telling us that first fruits must follow the weekly Sabbath during the Passover week. It has to be during the Passover week. The Enoch calendars that we have looked at place first fruits on, um, after the weekly Sabbath, but it's outside of the Passover festival week. So that doesn't agree with Joshua either. We'll look at chart number six out of these seven, where we'll find that first fruits is following the 7676 weekly Sabbath, Joshua 511, he said, and they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the self same day. And you've seen this chart before. Um, we have our uh, Passover sacrifice here, and they began to eat, eat their meal at the even, and they ate their Passover meal all that night. Anything that was left over had to be born, burned before the next morning, and first fruits followed on a bead 15. We already know that uh, Unleavened Bread Sabbath is on the same date as well, but definitely there's confirmation that first fruits is sharing the same date. First fruits follows Passover on a bead 15 within the Passover festival week. This is what Joshua is telling you in his account when they crossed into the land of Canaan. And I would like a reader for slide 46 and 47. A volunteer from anybody, just unmute your mic. Right, I'll do it. I'll okay. Do it. Okay, uh, hey, Ginger. Was a witness. Is Oh, can you hear me okay? Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, uh, we can hear you. Yes. Oh, sorry. Joshua's witness is easy to understand. Observation. Many that honor Yahuwah's festivals suggest first fruits is always celebrated on Abib 16, and it must follow the first Sabbath of unleavened bread. This is not true as shown in Joshua's testimony. The information from Joshua 5, uh, 10, and 11 clearly eliminates these two false teachings. In fact, it is impossible for the first fruits to be placed on B16 in this account with Joshua. However, this is not to say that first fruits can never be on a bib 16, just that first fruits is not always placed on a bib 16. The scriptural support for first fruits is of most importance beside Joshua. Supports, uh, support is found in Leviticus 23, Exodus 12, 16, 19, and the gospel account. Thank you, Ginger. You did really good. Excellent job. But this raises Another question, and I would like Ginger to read the next slide. And Ginger, I'd like you to add anything that you want to this slide when you're reading it, uh, whatever you're understanding. Okay. Um, number nine, Joshua confirms first fruits can be celebrated on Abib 16 if Passover falls on the sixth cycle on a Friday. Um, the first, now, should I, do you want me to read all that? I'm kind of nervous at reading. I'm yeah. Oh, oh, okay. So, Ginger, what if you have um, Passover on Friday right here? So, just explain what you see on this chart. Uh, that the, um, uh, I'm not quite sure. I, I'm, I, because I'm, I'm a little bit confused. Can you explain this? Okay, let's do that. So Joshua is saying first fruits can be celebrated on a beef 16. He's saying it can be on the 16th of a beef. We know right. most of the, at least I, most of the uh, feast keepers that I know are always celebrating first fruits on the 16th, no matter what day of the week it is. Okay. So it can be, first fruits can be on a beef 16, but in order for that to happen, 
Passover has to be on a Friday, the 14th. Then you have your Sabbath, your weekly Sabbath here on the 15th. That is also on leavened bread. And first fruits has to follow the weekly Sabbath. It has to be the day after the weekly Sabbath. So it would be on Abib 16. If Passover is on Friday the 14th, does that make sense, Ginger? Yeah, see, I'm kind of I'm hung up on some other types of calendars, so my brain is a little bit clouded, and, you know, I'm having to accept <laughs> things. So I'm like, uh, uh, uh. So I, I, right now, I need to chew the cut on it and, and read. But, yes, definitely, um, this, this definitely kind of pulls wool off of the eyes when you're stuck on the Wednesday calendar. You know, um, I'm, you know, I, so I'm, you know, I'm getting it. I'm open-minded and, you know, and let the Holy Spirit give us truth and, uh, you know, keep an open mind to everything. But right now I'm very excited about these new teachings. This is all new information for me. Excited. Very okay, excited. Ginger, you can just finish reading your slide. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, then Sabbath is a vid 15 and first Sabbath of unleavened bread. That's all I can see. Oh, first fruits follow on a vid 16. Yeah, that's yeah. that's what this is happening. If if uh, uh, Passover happens to be on a sixth okay. cycle or Friday the 14th. Then the next day is Sabbath. There's your unleavened bread. But first fruits always follows the Sabbath within the festival week. Okay. We're doing lots of review here, so maybe it'll be easier. I'm going to go on and do slide 48 and 49. And then Tim is going to do slides 50 to 59. And that is the meat of this whole presentation. So I'll do the next two slides. Which festival gets first place? Now we've got first fruits and unleavened bread Sabbath all on the same day of Abib 15. And we believe that every feast and festival is of utmost importance, whether it's an annual Sabbath or not. And in Joshua's account, we have two festivals sharing Abib 15. And the question is, which one is more important? Is it the first Sabbath of unleavened bread? Is that more important? Or is the first fruits festival the most important? And we're looking to see if Joshua gives priority to one of these so that we know, because they're both there. And um, the problem that I have had is that when I've attended some eight-day feast camps, I know not everybody can or not everybody has, but um, we have attended many um, eight-day spring feast camps, and First Fruits comes and goes, and nobody says anything about it. Uh, there was lots of emphasis for Passover, for the first and second Sabbath, the unleavened bread, of course, emphasis for the weekly Sabbath, but there was one feast I was at where it was First Fruits, and nobody said a word. So I went, oh, that's kind of strange. So we're going to see if Joshua actually has uh, chosen one to have priority. There were special instructions for the wave sheaf. To understand these important uh, instructions for first fruits, it is first helpful to investigate the grain in the land of Canaan. And I heard Tim say that he's working on part two for this. I don't know when it will be done, but it will be a really good study. The grain does hold clues that will help us to understand first fruits as fulfilled in Yahushua's life. This is the first recorded time Israel is ever celebrating the full spring festival because they didn't celebrate first fruits when they came out of Egypt and they did not celebrate it in the wilderness that we have an account of. Um, the uh, command by Moses was when you come into the land, that's when you're going to celebrate first fruits. Yahuwah had promised the Israelites the grain of the land would be ready for harvest upon their entrance into the land of Canaan, but that grain was declared off limits to eat, and they could not use it for personal purposes like preparing unleavened bread for Passover until after that wave sheep ceremony had been celebrated. So they're still using manna. The manna has still been following 
falling every single morning. There is one command that is recorded two times and it is extremely significant. The terms until, right here, and on this same day are very important to understand. So we are going to take a really close look at these terms and Tim is going to help you with some Hebrew on these next 10 slides. Thank you for mentioning about first fruits being unmentioned, Charlene. Thank you, because I've experienced the same thing. You go to a feast and everybody's happy about Passover and first Sabbath of unleavened bread and the week of unleavened bread, and then the second Sabbath is done, everything's finished. Oh, did anybody mention first fruits? What is that? Some people don't even don't even hear they haven't heard about it. And I we're going to look at that, and I'm going to ask you, well, Charlene asked you just a, a couple slides back, what feast day did Joshua give top priority to? And I want you to see on these next few slides, what do you think is the priority for the feast? The Shabbat day of unleavened bread or first fruits? Okay, here we go. Joshua 5.11 and Leviticus 23.14 agree. Joshua 5.11. And they ate of the stored grain of the land, when? On the morrow after the Passover. Unleavened bread and roasted grain on this same day. Please note this phrase. This is ultra, ultra important. Leviticus 23.14. This is the command for this same day. And you do not eat bread or roasted grain or fresh grain until when? Until the same day. Though the Hebrew words what we're going to see are the exact same words in these two verses. And they are not just there for coincidence. These are matched phrases and highly highly specific okay and uh, i'll finish the verse that you brought an offering that or until the same day that you brought an offering to your elohim a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings these this phrase is so highly specific and like charlene says well i, I believe that it's the meat of this of this study if this is this is the so important. On this same day, the primary point we need to pay attention to in the wave sheaf ceremony of the first fruits are the words until the same day, translated from the Hebrew words etzem ze. Etze. Please forgive me if I don't pronounce that correctly. The main word meanings of etzem are, and I that little star, flashing star, is there for a purpose. I want you to realize these words. Look at these words. Remember them because we're going to be looking at them very, very closely. Firmness, solidity, bone. And I have bone underlined for a reason. Essence and substance. All definitions link the wave sheaf first fruits ceremony to the self same day that is the day of the week it is not date of the month they are to be fulfilled in the antitype on the on the self same day what about the life we have always concentrated on the death of yahusha might we submit a portion of our thoughts to Yahusha's victory of life over death? After Yahusha died, what single event that is commanded to be observed yearly was actually signed, sealed, and forever etched into our salvation for eternity? What event is that? 
what about the life that was accepted? Do you remember me pointing you towards this word, accepted? Here's the reason why I wanted you to see this word. What about Yahusha's life when he laid his life down and he presented himself to the Father? What occurred? Was his life, was his ultimate sacrifice accepted? In the box now. Yahusha's death would have no meaning had he not presented himself before Yahuwah. It was here that Yahusha's sacrifice was accepted as perfection. And this is yet another Melchizedek covenant connection and fulfillment. And that word, those words presented himself are extremely explicit words. What contains this life support system? The word we see until, we see in the Hebrew, eh, sem. First fruits, wave sheaf presentation, acceptance. It was performed before Yahuwah, and it was within the Melchizedek covenant. That first fruits presentation of Yahusha before the Father, it was the embodiment, the skeletal bone structure, which was and still is the quintessential substance and essence of our salvation. Why do we see this skeleton on the right side of the screen? If you look in the middle, it says skeletal bone structure. This skeleton is be going to become very important. If you look on the top right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see the Paleo-Hebrew resh. What is that? What is the meaning of that? Sylvia, can you tell me the meaning of resh, please? That is the head, top, the beginning. Yes. What, thank you, Sylvia, what connects the skeletal bone concept to Yahuwah's life support system. Yahusha alone is salvation's administration center for life. This factor was finalized through Yahuwah's acceptance of Yahusha, the first fruit, on the feast of the wave sheaf, the first cycle of the week following the seventh day Sabbath. And this is directly out of the Messianic Testament at the crucifixion, the Passion Week. And uh, that, that, is, that is such an incredible example and proof of what we are studying in Joshua. It is just, it just I, I, I'm left speechless when I see how clear this is. Yahusha's skeletal bone distribution system purpose. The etzem, bone spinal cord central nervous support structure, which is the wave sheaf, the first fruit festival, and we see this through Joshua. This festival conveys vital salvational substance, and that is yearly timing and the Mashiach character identification, this, te this tells us, tells, it, it, it uh, show, shows us, Yahusha's etzem, bone notification system for the body of Yahusha, identifies the essence of our salvation through Yahusha's sacrificial acceptance on the first cycle after the seventh day Sabbath. Without Yahusha's acceptance before the Father on the day after his resurrection, we would not have salvation. And this, this etzem, the self-same day, the absolute bone foundation, the structural basis of our salvation, that is what this day is all about. And we have, for years and years, passed by this feast, 
not as an unmentionable, just something that nobody understood. What is it? Oh, it's, it's a wave shape of first fruits. That's, that's cool. Uh, what about the next, rest of the week? Well, I'm here to tell you that this is the foundation of our salvation. And when, when, uh, when Joshua was instructed to observe the first fruits on this self-same day, I can assure you he did it. Into the box here. Etzem directs us to first fruits as the backbone, the base foundation, the spinal cord, if you will, of Yahusha's plan to bring salvation to his body of people. Yahusha, by dying, then observing the wave sheaf, being the first fruit of victory over death, presented himself to Yahuwah. Yahuwah accepted Yahusha's monumental sacrifice. That acceptance is the substance and essence of our plan, or of the plan of our salvation. Now I'm going to ask you a question. What day do you think Joshua put full and absolute total emphasis on? Did he put it on the first Sabbath of unleavened bread, or was first fruits top of the chart to him? That is for something you to think about. Thank you, Charlene. Hey, uh, Charlene and Tim, you might, if I could point out something here too, we see this picture in us, the mystery with the bride and the bridegroom, that that same word, Sam is what Adam used when he saw Hava and said, Sam of my Sam, bone of my bone, and the bizarre of my bizarre, the flesh, the good news of my good news. So there's kind of shadow picture in that also. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you very much. Amen. This is why we all come yes. together. This is why we are told to assemble, because we all have pieces of the picture, and I love it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tim. I hope we have some time for questions or comments. Uh, I see our time is ticking by, um, and we still have quite a ways to go, but that just gives me goosebumps uh, when I hear what Tim has had to share. So first fruits in Melchizedek, because we're talking about a covenant calendar that connects to the, to the Melchizedek priesthood. We know that all feasts and festivals are types, and they all have their complete fulfillment in our Messiah as the highest Melchizedek priest. On the festival of first fruits, the very first harvest that was to fulfill the wave sheaf that represents our Melchizedek. This event looked forward. It was a prophecy that looked forward to the time when Yahushua was going to ascend to receive the announcement of whether or not his blood sacrifice really did pay all the requirements for the death penalty. And the actual cycle of the week, where the first fruits type actually fulfilled the antitype, or actually the other way around, the antitype fulfilled the type, right, was only and always to be on the first cycle of the week or on a Sunday. This was the prophecy for over 1,500 years that that was the day that Messiah was going to finish the plan of salvation. And if it was any other day, it was a false Messiah. So it was uh, really, really um, an incredible prophecy. So the timing of the resurrection and ascension, um, I know there's a lot of confusion over these two facts. We're just going to mention it here in case there's confusion with anybody tonight. Do not want you to confuse Yahushua's resurrection. That was on a weekly Sabbath, not a Sunday, like uh, most of Christendom teaches and even a lot of the feast groups. And his ascension was perfectly timed so that his presence was before Yahuwah as the earthly wave sheath was waved heavenward at the third hour of the day. And when we do the study on the Wednesday crucifixion, this is very, very crucial to recognize, and, and there are studies. We hope to do it on PowerPoint really, really soon. So which was honored first on a B15? <laughs> was it first fruits or unleavened bread? I think you know. Joshua's very first honor 
was applied to the Wave Sheaf Festival event, presenting Yahusha's ascension at the third hour. And his second honor was bestowed upon the first Sabbath of unleavened bread. And everything else on a beat 15 pales in comparison to that. So first fruits by by all means got top honors, especially in this particular um, witness from Joshua. So first honor goes to first fruits in the wave sheaf, but after the wave sheaf offering that was at the third hour from dawn, the people were then released from the command to refrain from eating the yield of the land. Remember, they had to wait. The significance of this prophecy, which is the presentation of the harvest to Yahuwah for acceptance, this should draw full attention to the skeletal bone structure of the plan of salvation. And this is through Yahuwah's feasts and festivals. And then, of course, remember, there's also another antitype at the end of time. I will do slide 63, and then Tim will help us with 64 and 65. I'd like you to be aware of any error that gives honor to just a bead 16. Please beware of a first fruits festival that is married to a bead 16 because it has no scriptural foundation whatsoever. And also be aware of any suggestions that say permission to eat the grain was not in effect until a beep 16. That was not true. If there were, if that were the case, this suggestion would eliminate the word usage of the same day. And why? Because Israel was given permission to eat the grain of the land on the same day that the grain was used for the wave sheaf offering. And yes, the grain was harvested, threshed, ground, and it was baked that day for unleavened bread. Because remember, they were still eating manna. I think, and Tim thinks, that understanding first fruits is a most important part of Joshua's study. So now we're ready for a review of uh, what we've done so far. Go ahead, Tim. You need your mic on. T <laughs> you need to put your mic on. <laughs> yep. Okay, there it is. <laughs> Three. The highlight of first fruits. Every first fruit, first fruits was a prophecy. And what did you say, Charlene? About fifteen hundred years of prophecy. That's a lot of prophecy. The third hour moment marked Yahuwah's skeletal bone structure plan for every single person. For at that time, Yahusha, as the wave sheaf, first fruits, would one day completely fulfill every requirement for the whole plan of salvation. And that means for each and every one of us, without exception. Our death penalty will then be satisfied and fully recognized through Yahusha, the highest priest of the Melchizedek <clears throat> order. Does this information illustrate how and why the First Fruits Festival is so important for us? And I will emphasize once again, is it possible that Joshua mis had made a mistake observing the First Fruits? Is this possible? Uh, do you want us to answer that, or is that rhetorical? I uh, just just asking, and I'm hoping you think about it very carefully. Okay. <laughs> the first <laughs> we we can answer this after after the slides are done because we we still got a, a few more to go yet. The first fruits yearly prophecy. This is why <laughs> first fruits was never to be celebrated as a floating festival each year. Every first fruits festival was a prophetic or was prophetic of the exact day of the week that Yahusha would represent the wave sheaf antitype that would be rehearsed for Israel. The prophecy was fulfilled when Yahusha, as the primary first fruit, was presented before his father 
after he talked with Miriam at the tomb, John 20, verse 17. Remember, he told her, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my father. And what was the attention, uh, intention of his ascension? He had to present himself to the Father, as we see in uh, Exodus 23, verse 17, I believe. We have to present ourselves before the Father, and that is exactly what Yahushua was doing. All this is the good news of first fruits. Thank you, Tim. I'll do the next two slides, and then you can help me out with 68 and 69. This is the last chart that we're going to be looking at, and this is actually Abib 16, and this is the day of no more manna. Joshua 5.12 says, And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. So we're just going to go over this very quickly. Passover was on Sabbath, Abib 14. Abib 15 houses first fruits and the unleavened bread Sabbath. And then the very next day is the day that the manna ceased. No more manna after that. Let's do our review slide, number 10 of 12. Joshua is confirming that celebrating first fruits absolutely has priority before honoring the first Sabbath of unleavened bread. It comes first when they're both on the same day. First fruits has way more significance because first fruits is a prophecy given about 1500 years in advance of when Yahusha would ascend heavenward. The celebration of first fruits should never ever be a forgotten festival. But now I have a question. The question is this. When a beat 15, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the 7676 Weekly Sabbath share the same date, which of those two Sabbaths has priority? And if we have time to answer it later on with um, comments, just save it, okay? as we're wanting to press through. But when you have a Friday Passover, and then you have the weekly Sabbath and your Feast of Unleavened Bread Sabbath on a B15, which one of those Sabbaths gets priority? That's the question. Okay, Tim, I'll have you do the next two slides. We're still doing a review. Another floating first fruits problem. Many that honor the feasts and festivals understand the placement of first fruits is always and only on Abib 16. In other words, first fruits married to Abib 16 floats on any day of the week from year to year. Why is this a problem? Two reasons. First fruits must follow the weekly 7676 Shabbat every year. It is not no, it, it is not impossible for Abib 16 to follow the weekly Sabbath every single year. Number two, the correct prophetic day of the week as specified for the first fruits, the day of first ascension of our Messiah is completely removed when tied to Abib 16. It just simply can't happen that way. Another problem needs to be addressed. Is it coming? Sorry. <laughs> it's coming. If first, <clears throat> excuse me, if first fruits is placed on a Beeb 16, following the first annual Sabbath of unleavened bread, the counting of the Omer will not be completely correct. As a result, the Pentecost festival will be seriously misplaced. And this takes us directly to the words, Completed Sabbaths, those Sabbaths and the counting of the Omer have to be fulfilled. Instruction for counting the Omer, Leviticus 23, 15 to 16. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Shabbat, that's H7676, from the day that you brought the sheath of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. 
Please note that word completed, which is often ignored. Verse 16. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh day Sabbath. 7676. Seven, then you shall offer a new grain offering to Yahuwah. Pentecost, or Shavuot, can only follow a seventh day Sabbath because there are no other annual Sabbaths or holy convocations close to this point in time for the 50th cycle to follow after. The next set of charts will illustrate the problem and the solution. Abib 14 Passover is placed on the seventh day Sabbath as seen in the book of Joshua. And I do want to say that the next time you see this study on Joshua, from a, it's going to be from a little bit different angle, and it's going to dig an awful lot deeper into the grains, and it's going to be a lot more clearer, again, just, it's just, just from a different picture. And you will be absolutely certain that Abib 14 Passover is placed on the seventh day Sabbath. Can't wait, Tim. Okay, I'll go through the next slides to slide 75, and I'll be looking for a reader for slide 76. We're going to look at two sets of charts. The first chart is going to be the problem of a floating first fruits on a babe 16, and all the charts will have Passover placed on an Abib 14 weekly Sabbath right here. Uh, this one is counting the Omer from an Abib 16 first fruits. This is um, the way that a lot of uh, feast groups are doing it. So here's Passover on Sabbath, Abib 14. When you place wave sheaf on would be a Monday or the second cycle of Abib 16, A16, Abib 16. You have only six days, one, two, three, four, five, six days here in this week. So that is an incomplete week. And for those of you that know already know how to do this, it's old hat. But there might be some that don't. So the very first week in this month that we have a full complete week is the week of a beep 22 to 28. So that's your first week of your Omer count. We're continuing on. There's your second week, your third week, fourth, your fifth week, your sixth week. And then you still have Omer count number 49 and 50. So we do not have seven completed weeks. When you start your count with a B16, uh, if you have your um, Passover on a Sabbath. So the problem is we only have six completed Omer weeks, and it's not a complete Omer count. So this doesn't work. Let's look at that day, right there. We're going to talk about this in our secular history. The 33rd day of the Omer count, <clears throat> which on the calendar here is um, Zif 18, if that is a proper name for the second month, I don't know. But I want you to take note of where this day is. Okay, we're going to be looking at that. Let's look at the second set of charts where you have the proper placement of first fruits and how easily it's going to solve the Omer count. We have our Passover on the weekly Sabbath, just like Joshua does. The wave sheep is put on the day after the weekly Sabbath. This is Abib 15. And here you have your very first complete week, and you also have a completed second week in this particular month. So we have two complete weeks of Abib right here in this chart. We're going to take the next two days to the next chart. We are in the second month, and there we have our third week, fourth, our fifth week, and the sixth week, and a completely satisfying seventh week, seven sevens, and then we have our Pentecost, or Shavuot, on day 50, it follows the weekly Sabbath, just like the wave sheaf did. The day after the weekly Sabbath, we have seven completed weeks. So when you place first fruits after the weekly Sabbath within the Passover festival week, you will always have seven perfect completed Omer weeks every single time. 
You won't have some weeks that have four days or five days or two days or who knows how many days. Okay, I need a reader for slide 76. Anybody? I could read again if nobody's up to it. Okay. On, on, on number 11, Joshua confirms when the first fruits follows the uh, strong H7676 weekly Sabbath, beginning Omer count number one. There will be seven perfect completed weeks to the 50th day of Pentecost. So that's a review slide. I, I think that you're probably all beginning to see the picture forming here. Very interesting. I'll do this slide, and then I would like Tim to pick up 78 to 81. We are now going to look at a second witness to settle the challenge of first fruit placements, and this is going to be through historical research. We've done everything in, in the scriptures. Let's look at some historical research. And is there really some history around Abib 16? You might be surprised at what you find. The unscriptural, traditional command of first fruits on Abib 16. Truth. I need some words. Oh, the there you go. <laughs> <laughs> first fruits is always celebrated on the morrow after the weekly Sabbath during the spring festivals. This is day one for counting the Omer. Omer means sheaf. The command for counting the Omer originates in Leviticus 23.15. It is a mitzvah to count the Omer for the seven completed weeks between Passover and Pentecost. Tradition. First Fruits Festival is always fixed to the Abib 16 date as a floating first fruits. Counting the Omer is according to Jewish tradition. That word so that tradition. Is me. Mm -hmm. Jewish tradition leads the way. The Jews Omer count from first fruits to Pentecost always begins on the third day of the Passover spring festival. First fruits always follows the first Sabbath of unleavened bread with celebrations on Abib 16. Did you see that in Joshua's account today? Just a thought. There are also a series of restrictions that arise during the period of the counting of the Omer up until Lag Ma'omer, which translates as the 33rd day in the count of the Omer. Their tradition is to mourn the first 33 days until the 34th day in the morning why will they why do they want us to accept to be mournful on the first 33 days that is the question for the jews a large portion of the seven week counting period is considered a mourning period that ends with lag Omer. please notice the 33rd day what does that number 33 what does that bring you to is as any is anybody familiar with the 33 degrees of in the illuminati okay that should raise a red flag immediately although it does for me in a very big way what is lag baomer lag baomer is a minor Jewish holiday that falls between the festivals of Passover and Pentecost. In Jewish tradition, the 33rd day of the Omer count is regarded as a holiday that commemorates the death of Rashbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and he lived in 80 to 160 AD. Lag Ma'omer. Hebrew letters may be used to express numbers, and indeed they do. Lag 
is a combination of two Hebrew letters, Lamed and Gimel. The word Lag is an acronym for 33, derived from Lamed, 30, and Gimel, 30 or 3. The phrase Lag Baomer indicates the 33rd day of the Omer count. And I'm glad you got that calendar with red on it, Charlene, because that raises a red flag for me. It is always celebrated on the 18th of the second month, Ziff, on the Jewish calendar. Thank you, Tim. Um, Tim, I'll have you back on at slides 90 to 92, and I'll go through this. 33 stuff. Who is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yoke, or however you say that? <clears throat> Shortcut, Rashbi. Lived from 80 to 160 AD. He was a disciple of Rabbi Akiva, who lived from 50 to 135 AD. Guess what? Rashbi is the author of the Zohar, the most famous book of the Kabbalah. Red Many flag, Jews anyone? have witnessed miracles. <laughs> <laughs> Many Jews have witnessed miracles of all kinds after praying at his holy grave site. And uh, this is a picture of kind of what it is over there in the land. On the day of Rashbai's death, he revealed the mystical dimension of the Torah, known as the Kabbalah, a form of Jewish mysticism. This is Goosebumpy information. What is Rashbi's connection to Lagba Omar? Let's take a look. The day of his death was the 33rd day of the Omer count. And on every anniversary, there are celebrations for this hidden Torah or the anniversary of the revelation of Kabbalah. This Jewish holiday holds equal importance to Pentecost. And they equate that to the giving of the written Torah to Moses. Equal importance to Pentecost. Celebrations are held in the village of Moran near Israel. This is where they believe Rashbai's supposed burial site is. Hundreds of thousands of Jews gather at Mount Moran to pray and celebrate the Kabbalah. This is every single year. Many bonfires are lit at sunset on the 32nd day of the Omer count to commemorate the death of Rashbai. And remember, their day starts at sunset, so that's why they're lighting the fires at sunset on the 32nd day. They believe that is the day that, that's the time that the 33rd day is ushered in. I just want to show you some posters that I picked up from May 2015 is when we actually did this PowerPoint. And, uh, if you go on the internet around this time, you will find all kinds of posters all over the world. This is not just in Israel. It's all over the world. They are celebrating this in a huge, huge way. Lag Bar Omar is a huge Jewish celebration. It's not something to wink at. And the internet is emphatic about this festival day on the Jewish calendar. And it is amazing the amount of internet coverage that you will find. Uh, you can go there any old year. This one I had um, researched for 2015 because I was getting this um, slide, this uh, Joshua ready for 2016. May 7th was the 33rd day of the Omer count for 2015. And like I said, every year this celebration is attended with a lot of fanfare, lots of mystic sage. Um, conversation going on for Rashbai and the anniversary of his death. It is a very, very popular celebration. Um, here's a poster for New York City. Uh, this was in May 2015, May 6. See that? They're starting at 8 o'clock at night, so definitely that is um, into their 33rd day with sunset. This is a poster which is interesting. The dates are December 18 to 19. This is 2006. But this is for San Diego, California. And they are announcing, um, come and find out about this um, very important Jewish holiday. And I don't know if you can read it here at the bottom, 
but they have an institute where they're going to teach you all about this so that you're all ready for when the 33rd day comes along. Well, the question is, how in the world did Rashbai's, de Rashbai's death get connected to first fruits? In the year that Rashbai died, the Jews could have been celebrating first fruits. They could have been celebrating first fruits on the first day of the week, according to the instructions in Leviticus 23 and, of course, Numbers. And there is historical evidence of this, although I don't have it here. Therefore, the 33rd day of the Omer count would be the 18th day of the second month for that year only. If they were celebrating from a first fruits on a Sunday that follows the Sabbath, that year it would have been uh, May 7th, would have been the 33rd day. Well, whatever day. But remember that Rashbai died on the 33rd day of the Omer count, and that is a very interesting mystical number. So for over 1850 years, Rashbai has been honored as a saint on every 33rd day of the Omer count, and that day always links back to Abib 16 as first fruits, even if it is not the true first fruits. So that is how he that date got married to Abib 16 first fruits. His death changed the correct timing of first fruits, and that is how first fruits became permanently tied to the date of Bib 16. And like I said, in that year, first fruits could have been correctly located on a Bib 16 Sunday, the first day of the week. When first fruits is married to a Bib 16, it does not land on the first cycle every single year. Since that time, the 33 days are always counted back to the date of Abib 16, so that Rabbi's death would always be celebrated on the 18th day of the second month. However, this event not only became a problem, but also a widely accepted counterfeit, just as sunset is a counterfeit for a creation's day start. And we have learned that we need to be willing to challenge every single teaching to see if it links with a tradition, because some of the things that we hold might actually be a tradition. Yeah. Here's a question for us, because we are covenant Torah keepers with the blood-ratified Book of the Covenant. Should covenant Torah keepers Observe Lagba Amar. I say no. That holiday is not a Torah command. It is derived entirely from rabbinic and occultic tradition. Everything about that celebration is linked to mystical writings of Kabbalah. And Rashbai, he did not acknowledge Yahusha as the Messiah. And Kabbalah, it is a deceptive system of thought. It seduces people into denying that they are sinners, that they even need salvation. The Kabbalah believes that each of us are essentially divine beings, so we don't need a Messiah. There's no reason to have a Savior, because everyone is pure, and they just need to be enlightened. And guess how you get enlightened? Through the mystical worship of Lucifer. Tim, can you do slides 90? to 92 with your microphone on. <laughs> <laughs> it is clear that traditional first fruits linked to only Abid 16 has strong ties to Kabbalistic ways, including mysticism and all associated links to the Jesuits and secret societies. Yeah, I, I actually, I, w I would like to correct what I said earlier when I said about the 33 degree being tied to the Illuminati. I made a mistake. It should be to the Masonry sector. Sorry. Um, continuing. Question. Why are so many so-called Torah feast keepers honoring Abib 16 when this date is widely connected to such mysticism? Good question. Don't know. Let's tell them. 
Lag Omer definitely counterfeits the true meaning of first fruits. Yahushua did not ascend to heaven on any day of the week except for the first cycle. Should honest Torah keepers sever their connection to a yearly Abib 16 first fruits? And I say, yes, absolutely, beyond any shadow of a doubt. Okay, I will be looking for a reader on slide 95. Does this mean that first fruits festival is never, ever on Abib 16? Can we say that? No, we cannot say that. And this is a bit of a, re a review. There is no rule that first fruits can never occur on Abib 16. Because if Passover is on Friday, Abib 14, then Abib 15 is going to be on the seventh day Sabbath, and of course on leavened bread. And therefore, the very next day after the Sabbath is Abib 16. That's where you're going to celebrate first fruits on the day after the weekly Sabbath. Many feast keepers and ministries have first fruits still married to a beep 16, and we're just wondering how they missed the clear instructions from Torah. And I don't think they saw the Joshua study. <coughs> but the result? First fruits on a beep 16 becomes a floating date on the calendar, and it demands that Pentecost is also going to be a floating date. Now on the next slide, I'm going to show you a calendar from another Christian feast ministry, how they have First Fruits Festival married to Abib 16. And our question is, on their calendar, this is a 2015 feast calendar, <coughs> will the following <coughs> Christian feast calendar compare to the traditional Jewish calendar for 2015? <coughs> Day one of the Omer count, for them begins at sunset right here on Sunday, April 5, and first fruits is right here on Monday, April 6. So in this week, you actually have your seven day count because they start at sunset on unleavened bread. Then you have 8 to 14 Omer count, 15 to 21, and you have 22 to 26 in the month of Abib. What we're looking for is will day 33 of the Omer count land on Thursday, May 7, 2015, exactly like the Jewish calendar. So let's have a look. This is our count that is continuing from April or from Abib. Here we are going to finish our count for Omer count 27, 28. Then May 3rd is 29. There's day 30, 31, 32. Look what we have here. Abib, our Omer count number 33 lands on May the 7th. Absolutely, this Christian feast calendar does favor Lagba Omer, which begins at sunset on May 6th. And May 7th is the 33rd day. Remember, they're counting 33 starting at sunset. Christian feast keepers follow this Jewish calendar. They likely do not know that the 33rd day of the Omer count pays respect to the great mystic sage Rashbai. And when they find out, perhaps they will celebrate first fruits and wave sheep festival according to the instructions of Moses and Joshua, like we are learning to do. I'd like to have a reader for this slide. It's a lot of reading. Do I have a volunteer? This is an endorsement from Julian Morgenstern from the Hebrew Union College in Indiana. He was also a president of the Hebrew Union College. They were originally founded in 1875, and besides Israel, there are five Hebrew Union colleges in the United States, and there's in other parts of the world as well. I need a volunteer quickly. I can. Thank you, Jeanette. Okay, endorsement from J. Morgenstern, Hebrew Union College, Indiana. 
Actually, the legislation for the bringing of the Omer, the first sheaf of the new annual crop, is recorded in only one passage of the entire Pentateuch, Leviticus 23, 9 to 16. This legislation provides that the Omer is to be waved before Yahweh by the priest upon the day following the Sabbath. The basic difficulty here is the determination of the precise dating Im implicit in the term the day after the Sabbath. The customary interpretation accepted by most present-day biblical scholars is that the Sabbath here is the Sabbath which falls within the week of the Passover Masot festival. Such, uh, such too was the interpretation given of old to this term by three quite ancient Jewish sects. The Samaritans, uh, the Bohethusians, <laughs> Bohuthesians, I'm sorry, you can't do that one, and the Kararites. This would imply, of course, that the day of bringing the Omer was always a Sunday. And also, since the counting of the 50 days, which intervened between the day of bringing the Omer and the Sabbat uh, festival commenced upon a Sunday, the latter festival also would fall always upon a Sunday. Thank you so much, Jeanette. <clears throat> and Jeanette, I'd like you to read slide 99 when we get there, because Tim is going to do the next three slides. So we say yes to everything that we hear here. That's exactly what we found in the Joshua account, is um, exactly what Morgan Stern is telling us. OK, Tim. <clears throat> it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> Besides history. Morgan Stern's testimony and the witness in the Exodus 12, 16, and 19 account of Passover to Pentecost, Josh's first fruits is not married to Eve 16, the day following the first Sabbath of unleavened bread. First fruits is always placed within the Passover festival, and this is in directly contrary to Enoch's teaching, which has, which has first fruits outside of the Passover unleavened bread. So it, it does not align with Joshua's example by inspired word. It's coming. <laughs> Counsel from the Apostle Paul, Ephesians 5, 8 to 13, verse 8. You were once in darkness, but now you are light in Yahuwah. Walk as children of light, for the, spirit, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to Yahuwah. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. It's very possible many do not understand it is complete darkness to consistently celebrate first fruits on Abib 16. Leviticus 23, along with Joshua, Exodus, and the Gospel account, expose the unfruitful works of darkness. Once the evidence is brought forth, everyone can make their choice. Mm. Okay, Jeanette, can you read our one of our last slides of comparing these two? Okay. Comparing the evidence. First fruits by tradition and first fruits by scripture. So under first fruits by tradition, when first fruits is consistently celebrated on Abib 16, it links to a rabbi that gravitated towards the darkness of mysticism and Kabbalah which has powerful ties to the Prince of Darkness. So under First Fruits by Scripture, 
When the first fruits is celebrated on the morrow after the weekly Sabbath, it links to our Messiah when he presented himself as the leading first fruits after his resurrection. First fruits links to that ascension event, a powerful victory for his children. This is extremely significant and important because it is one of the most basic events known to man, providing the foundational, or the bone, structure of the plan of salvation. Mm. First fruits festival choices. The tradition of Aviv 16 pales in compa comparison to the Torah truth of the first fruits festival. And what does Joshua say? Choose this day whom you will serve. We have two choices. First fruits following the H7676 weekly Sabbath that honors Yahushua's ascension and victory for us. Or the other choice is honor first fruits following a beep, uh, the unleavened bread Sabbath on a beep 16. And that honors Rashbe and the Kabbalah mysticism. Everybody has a choice. But 1 Corinthians 14, 33 and verse 40, I like to end up with this. For Yahuwah is not the author of confusion. Let all things be done decently and in order. And we're hoping that Yahuwah will bless you abundantly in your search for his divine truth and for uncovering some of these counterfeits that we've been coming across. Our next covenant calendar study is going to be David's Kodesh Lechem. It's going to have another interesting counting puzzle, and it will address the error of weekly Sabbaths that follow the lunar cycle. So if you have any questions or comments on today's study, and if we have any time left, we'll take them. That's it. The end. <laughs> Oh, wonderful teaching. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> very clear. Very I thought it was very convenient or very significant how uh, first fruit started on the first day of the week and it ended on the first day of the week. It's like, wow, that caught my attention. i just like to say that uh, when, we pre when I presented this study to Matthew Nolan, it was March third or fourth of 2016. Uh, this was the study he requested to see. He knew nothing about it. Um, halfway through, he just, <laughs> it was funny. He, he was taking notes all the way along and he put his pencil down and he sat back and he said, everybody ears up. He said, I want you to see what's going on here. He said, this is a good Bible study. And um, we all learned a lot that night. And um, we, we all learned how very clear Joshua is about where First Fruits goes. There is no argument whatsoever. So we thank you for watching and hope you learned something. Anybody have any questions at all? As a, wow. As, a, as anything about Joseph's bones leaving uh, Egypt and going to Canaan has relation to this also because I think it ties up. I'm not sure, but you know what my previous reading it does ties up Joseph Bones landing in Canaan. Hey, t can I share something here with I'm I this I am loving this study and I love what you were brought and bringing out about with the skull and seeing this in first fruits because with that word eights m. That being, and I want to re, I want to read this little passage from Genesis because this is beaut this is beautiful. You know when when Yahuwah took the rib from Adam, that word rib is sela. And if you look at the first definition at in the Klein's etymological etymological dictionary, it means to roast. So when we're talking about that first fruit offering, that in that word rib, it says, and we see this is Yeshua's death and his resurrection and the first fruits. In uh, Exodus 2.21, or Genesis 2.21, it says, So Yahuwah Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then he took one of the ribs, the cella, that means this, it's to roast, and it also means to shadow. So, and he closed up the flesh at that place, and Yahuwah Elohim fashioned a woman 
and into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now Aitzim of my Aitzim and the Besorah of my Besorah. This is the substance of my sus substance and the good news of my good news. So we see this by the time Shavuot comes and you're raising the two loaves that what Yahweh, once he's accepted that, he's connecting that to the bride later. It's it's because of that we see that connection. He's bringing the bride back. I think it's beautiful. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Sylvia. Mm -hmm. well, I'm excited to get this up and online really quick. So once it's up, share it with everybody that, that you know. Grab a link and start passing it around. I think it's uh, vitally important, especially when we recognize that that 16th, business is literally attached to death as opposed to life. That's like, uh, oh my goodness. I have a, a quick question, um, maybe asking for someone else. Is there a difference uh, or uh, what are the differences between first fruits and the wave offering or shot, uh, sheave offering? Somebody want to address that? The wave sheaf was the well the first wave sheaf was the actual grain that they that they cut uh, gathered into a sheaf and it was symbolic and that's that was what was waved before Yahush or before uh, before the altar uh, the first fruits Yahusha well okay the, the wave sheaf was actually the first fruits in the land of Canaan it was actually the first grain that they cut that Yahuwah had provided for them, it was already grown, it had already been planted, it was, so it was a first fruit to them, provided by Yahuwah. And Yahusha, after his resurrection, he was, he was the, the anti-type, which was fulfilling the type, and he was, he became the first fruit of, um, the first fruit back from, or he had victory over death. He, my, my tongue's getting mixed up here. He was the first fruit. He was the type of that sheaf of grain, and he presented himself as the first from the victory over death. He presented himself to the Father. That's, that's what I see as the difference. Yeah. I was just wondering, uh, uh, do we see two wave offerings? Uh, First fruits and then on Shavuot. I believe that there is um, a, a wave sheaf. They, they did wave uh, two loaves at uh, Shavuot. Uh, we haven't studied that in detail at this point in time yet, but that's why I wanted to specify that this study with Joshua was the wave sheaf connected to the Passover festival. So the other one, I don't have a study on it yet. Okay. Well, this one was absolutely fantastic. This was great. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Yay. Um, I want to I have a I have a question. Yes, go ahead. I uh, see like uh, Yeshua is definitely the first fruit and he ascended to before the presence of Yahweh on the first day of the week. There's no doubt about that. But you know when we read the scripture it says that uh, like on the day of his resurrection, that is that is on Sabbath, there were many others also who woke up and people had seen them. So were they also presented as first fruits? Yes, on Sunday. Yeah, were they also presented as first fruits? Because yes. there's nothing in the scripture to indicate that. I'm just asking what happened to them if they rose from the dead, like later Lazarus when they rose from the dead, did they live again and then go back and die or were they presented as first fruits? You want to address that, Charlene? Uh, yes. Um, what I like Tim's comments where the grain of the land of Canaan was chosen by Yahuwah. He had he was the one that got that already. He was the one that chose his son Yahusha to be the um, to uh, pay the death penalty for our salvation. But when he arose from the grave, he also had a first fruit. He was a first fruit, and he also had first fruits. And uh, definitely, um, I believe that he took those 
first fruits. Uh, heavenward with him on Wave Sheep Day, the first fruits day, and that they are now ministering with him. I believe that they came back with him. They ministered in the land for those 40 days that he was there, and that they did return with him to heaven to minister as the 24 elders that you read about in Revelation 4 and 5. Because we know that every high priest has also uh, priests that help them with uh, the duties of the sanctuary. So if we're following the typology of the sanctuary on earth, um, it seems reasonable that Yahushua, as our highest Melchizedek priest, now also has his ministering priests around him on the throne. Um, we, haven't, we haven't really pursued our studies into that area at this point in time, but yes, Joy, um, yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bob. This is some conclusion that I came on my own with prayer and thing, but I know I was not certain, you know. When I discussed with some some other people, they told me, you know, they lived and they died again like Lazarus and all that. But I was not convinced with all no. that, you know. But today it cleared up a lot of things. Thanks. It it actually says that he led captivity captive. He he led them, he broke their captivity of the grave. And um, uh, I think that's in Psalms uh, uh, 24. Uh, somewhere in there. So yes, they they were especially chosen, and I believe that they were martyrs for him. And the very first martyr that we had on this earth was Abel. The very last martyr before Yahushua died was John the Baptist. We know we had Zacharias that was a martyr. So was Isaiah a martyr? Uh, I don't know who all of them were, but it's very evident that they were martyrs that they gave their blood for him and he's taking them as witnesses. And I think that when these 24 witnesses from, from Abel, I, did I say Adam? I meant Abel if I didn't say it right. Abel to John the Baptist going into Jerusalem at the time of the resurrection. What a witness. But unfortunately, the disciples were locked behind barred doors. They were afraid that they were going to be next on the cross, and they were not an eyewitness to this incredible event. So the uh, the gospel writers don't have anything written because they were not eyewitnesses to what happened. But it does say that they went into the city and that they they witnessed. They were they were the they were the witness that um, this whole event really did happen. So yeah. wonderful, study. wonderful teaching. I again want to thank you for sharing it. I want to uh, thank those that are looking into it and listening to it, and I pray that they are blessed. Um, we're going to go one, ahead and stop. One last, one last uh, thing. You know, it's just personal. It has no relation to the thing. Like when you are alone, like, you know, I am in India, I am in Coimbatore, I am in Ecuador. I don't have any thought of the illegals nearby or anybody like that. So how do I celebrate Passover? Usually what I do is I've been doing it for three years. I all these days, I just pray and um, I just go to my home. I don't even have my family with me. So, how do you celebrate Passover on your own without a fellowship or without? A... Because I don't have any believers with me. All the only believers I have is Sunday believers and all that. I think about they think that I'm alone. Um, are you uh, asking for a how-to? How, yeah, how do I celebrate Passover? Because I am alone, you know, like I, I, I mean, there's nothing which I can imitate or I, or I can do. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, um, st stay on the line and we'll address that in just one moment. What I want to do yeah. is, uh, is uh, thank everybody for watching. I'm going to turn off the recording and we have some prayer requests also that we could do as a, as a, as a uh, group. So uh, once again, thank you for the study. Thank you for watching, and we're turning the recorder off. Yeah.